hey, so yeah, we get it. You need great UX and CX to delight and retain your customers. But what about those app developers who are building these great experiences for your customers and end users? Well, we have Eric joining us to talk about improving the developer experience to help increase productivity and their happiness and essentially the quality of their code, your software, and your business. Take it away, Eric. Thanks, Rita. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, my name is Eric Arias. I'm a senior product designer for Spring Cloud Services at VMware. And today I would like to talk to you about user research and why I believe teams working on APIs and other developer tools should consider a structured approach for collecting user feedback. I'd also like to give you an overview of our research process to show you the steps that are involved and the value it could provide your team. But before I show you anything, I'm going to just show you this uh, safe harbor statement, which basically just says that anything I show you in this presentation about our offerings is subject to change because it's all still mostly under development. So um, just going to give you a little bit of background about my uh, experience. So before joining Spring, uh, I was a consultant with Pivotal Labs, where I coached product teams on the fundamentals of user-centered design and lean product management. I decided to join Spring because I was convinced that the same methodologies that we were using at Labs could also be used to design APIs and other developer tools. So thus began my adventures on the Spring Cloud Services team. Our team develops commercial Spring products for Tanzu, like Spring Cloud Services, Spring Cloud Gateway, and Spring Cloud Dataflow. We're also working on a new product called API Hub, which is still under development, and you should definitely check it out once it comes out. So we're a distributed team, and as you can see from this map, we're mostly situated in North America and in Europe. And since joining the team, my focus has mostly been on um, Spring Cloud Gateway and API Hub. So for those of you that aren't familiar with these products yet, uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview. So unlike, an, unlike other API management solutions, Spring Cloud Gateway and API Hub focus on being a developer-friendly and cloud-native solution that provides governance and auditing capabilities. Here are just some of the highlights I'd like to share with you. Okay, so Spring Cloud Gateway allows developers to deploy their own gateway instances and manage their own route configurations. This means that developers no longer have to wait on support tickets or approvals from central operations groups to get their APIs in the hands of consumers. Gateway also handles cross-cutting concerns such as SSO and rate limiting to ensure a common, a compliant, and centrally managed approach. API Hub is a GUI-based UI that gives consumers a place to discover and securely access services from multiple gateways and from multiple foundations. It also allows service providers to manage access to those services using API keys. We built these products because we saw a need for providing a consistent, reliable, and developer-friendly approach for exposing APIs to consumers. This is mostly due to the increased adoption of microservice by, organ by organizations. Consumers have come to expect APIs that are easy to use and that provide a better overall developer experience, which is also known as DX. To give you an idea of how important DX is, I'd like to show you some data from a survey conducted by SmartBear called the State of API. The survey team found that developers want tools that are easy to use, easy to implement, and that fit into their existing tool set when they're evaluating APIs. This is because the increased complexity of the API tooling ecosystem has led to a greater focus on usability and experience. They also found that organizations consider performance the number one indicator for measuring the success of their APIs. The number two indicator, however, is usability and DX. This is because developers have a lot of options when they're choosing different API products, and they usually tend to pick the ones with the best DX. Internal developers, on the other hand, they might not have the same options, but good internal DX practices will likely increase your organization's productivity and likely reduce your technical debt over time. So what does this data tell us about how we should approach API development? Well, Greg Braille, a principal engineer at Google, says that we should therefore prioritize developer engagement. Just like any other product, 
APIs require teams to manage them, feedback cycles with customers, and iteration to constantly evolve your product. I completely agree with this statement because we should be collecting user feedback often so that we're in a better place to meet the ever-evolving needs of our developers. But how do you know you're getting the right type of feedback? It isn't enough just to ask your users what type of features they want, because what they say they want and what they actually need could be completely different. This is why our team takes a user-centered approach for gathering, interpreting, and acting on insights from real users. So I'm going to show you what our process looks like on the Spring Cloud Services team. And I'm going to be using some examples from one of our products called API Hub to illustrate. As I mentioned earlier, API Hub is a GUI-based UI that helps developers discover and manage APIs aggregated from multiple gateways. So just to look at our process, uh, it breaks down into four different stages. The first stage is used for generative research. And the second half is for evaluative research. In the empathize stage, we engage with users by conducting interviews and observations. Next, we make sense of our research by identifying patterns which reveal user insights and problems. Then in the ideate stage, we generate ideas for solving these problems that we found. And finally, we build a prototype to evaluate the effectiveness and the usability of our solution. I'd also like to add that this process doesn't necessarily have to be uh, done from beginning to end. If your problem is clearly defined, then you could probably just start with the ideation phase. And the opposite is true too. If you just have a few open questions that you need answered, conducting a few interviews might be enough. The point is that the methods that you use should reflect the type of research that you need. But before we get started with talking to users, we should define our goals. These are gonna help our team decide where to focus our time and effort. Goals should be broadly defined, measurable, and user-focused. Try to avoid mentioning any specific solutions or feature sets. Instead, think about the outcomes that you want for your user. For example, our two goals that we started with were to give consumers a way to discover and access APIs. And for service providers, it was a way to manage that access using, well, just managing that access to those services. As you can see, our goals don't mention any specific solutions and can easily be measured by whether or not we deliver on the outcome. So once we have our goals set, we're ready to get started with the empathize stage. But first we need to figure out who we need to talk to. And to do this, we identify user personas. These help us generalize segments of our user base that share similar characteristics. You can think of things like goals, behaviors, needs, and pain points. This helps us understand our user motivations and the challenges that they're facing. And if you start by doing these, it's okay if you don't have them perfect to begin with. The more you collect feedback, then you can start updating them so that you are based on actual evidence and not just your assumptions. These were the four personas that we started with for API Hub. API consumers, they want to discover and access services needed to deliver new features for their own applications. API producers want to expose those services to consumers without going through too many hoops. API managers, well, as their name might suggest, are responsible for managing APIs. They're interested in things like usage, performance, and monetization. This role varies from company to company, but usually this person's like a product manager or a lead developer, anyone that's in charge of an API or set of APIs. And finally, we have our operators, which are responsible for installing and configuring API Hub on the platform. The next thing we have to do is unpack what the team already understands about the goal using an activity called an assumption generation. Now, assumptions are anything that we believe to be true, but aren't actually based on any facts or evidence. We capture these now so that we can determine which questions that we need to ask during our research. On the left are some of the assumptions that we generated for API consumers. We assumed that consumers have trouble securely accessing APIs, want to view documentation, and want to test endpoints before investing in full integration. 
After we generate these, we prioritize them on something called a two by two. That's the uh, cross you see on the right. So on this two by two, um, we have the vertical line that represents the amount of risk to our project if the assumption ends up being wrong. And the horizontal line represents how much we know or don't know about the assumption. The red box indicates which assumptions we believe are most important to validate with our users. Typically, they're the ones at the top right, which are riskier and more unknown. Next, we prepare for our interviews. And you can think of these in three parts. Here are some of the activities you should consider for each. So first, you start by recruiting some interviewees. They need to fit the description of the persona that the goal aims to help. I do this by asking a few screener questions when I reach out to users. A bit of advice, don't just ask recruits for their job title or for their role. Instead, ask them for certain activities that they perform and technologies that they use. It also helps to find recruits with different backgrounds and levels of experience. You're more likely to get better insights if you talk to a diverse set of users with different perspectives. Next, we have the team generate questions for each one of the assumptions you generated. These questions will guide the conversation during your interview and help you validate assumptions to see if they're true. During the interview, everyone has a role to play. There should be one facilitator who's asking most of the questions, while everyone else is capturing notes of anything interesting or any quotes that they feel like might, be, um, might actually uh, validate their assumptions. We should also agree on some team norms during interviews so that they run smoothly. For example, when is it appropriate for the note takers to ask their questions? Do you want them to ask during the interview or do you want them to wait till the end? Another thing to think about is, do you plan on recording the interview? This really helps for teammates that weren't able to join the, the interview, but it could be a toss up. Some people don't feel comfortable with that. So you wanna establish that early. Norms make it easy to conduct consistent interviews that you can then improve on over time. After each interview, the team should discuss what was said to clear up any confusion that there might be, that might be there. Use this time to also collect uh, everybody's notes and consolidate them into some documents so that you, they don't get lost. So once you've collected enough data, you wanna interpret the findings. And we do this in the define stage. For this, we use an approach called research synthesis. This involves grouping similar notes taken during your interviews and then summarizing them into key insights and problems. This makes it easier to interpret the most relevant information about each interview. We continue this process until the team decides that there's sufficient evidence to validate our assumptions and we have a clearly defined problem to solve. Here's a screenshot of one of our synthesis. I know it's a little blurry to read, but along the left side, you have labels that show which users uh, we talk to. And along the top, you have different groups that our notes were grouped into that kind of relate to each other. These groups start naturally forming as you start putting your notes in here and you kind of put notes together that are you know, relatively similar. At the bottom, you have your summary. So you distill all of those notes within each group into an insight statement or a problem statement. Some of the things that we learned during our research were that terminology for API documentation is often inconsistent between products, which makes it really difficult for consumers to understand without having any context. Another thing that we learned was that accessing APIs could be a struggle for some API consumers because the process for obtaining an API key can typically be pretty slow. So they often share keys to avoid having to wait. They know they shouldn't do this, but they feel it's necessary in order to get things done quickly. Another thing that we do is keep track of our assumptions. Each time we validate an assumption, we add quotes and insights from our synthesis to add as supporting evidence for each of the validations. If an assumption is proven to be invalidated, we typically write, rewrite that assumption to reflect what's actually true. Tracking assumptions is a great way to make sure your key insights don't get lost. It also gives everyone on your team equal access to the most relevant information about your users. Here's an example of one of the validated assumptions from our research. We believe that API managers want API key observability because it's useful for things like security and auditing purposes. 
And here are some of the quotes that back it up. Some people felt this information was absolutely necessary and that it would help them uh, identify different bad customers and that an audit trail would help them understand who accessed what when. So with our validated assumptions and problems in hand, we're ready to start the third stage, which is ideation. Our team uses an exercise called a design studio to quickly sketch out solutions. To start, you take one of the problems that you uncovered during your interviews and pose it as a how might we question. On the right is an example of one of our how might we questions that we used for one of our uh, design uh, studios. I prompted the team with, how might we help API consumers quickly and securely access APIs without involving operations? After a few minutes of drawing, everyone presents their favorite solutions to the team, and we discuss the strengths and weaknesses as they relate to the problem. Then we decide which idea or combination of ideas the team feels work best. This might require a few rounds of sketching, but that's okay. Naturally, these ideas become, to be, they become more closely aligned with each round that goes by. This technique can also be adapted for things like APIs, and systems architectures using things like diagrams and models. The point of this exercise is to generate ideas and discuss the pros and cons, regardless of the type of product you're building. On the left is a photo of a sketch that one of our engineers drew. This was for an early concept where we wanted to show a list of endpoints. Now we can finally create our prototype. And in UX, Prototypes are usually clickable mockups that allow a user to navigate by clicking through. For prototyping APIs, there are a lot of tools available for generating things like documentation and mock servers that return data. To evaluate our prototype, we conduct usability tests. And just like our interviews, you can think of them in three parts. You start by preparing a scenario for your test participants. You'd say something like, imagine you picked up a story from the backlog and it required you to access an API managed by another team. Show me how you do that using this prototype. This scenario will help you, will set the scene for your test participant and also act as a blueprint when you go and go to build your prototype. Next, you identify the tasks that the user needs to perform in order to successfully complete a scenario. An example of this might be that the user clicks on a button or enters a specific command. And now it's time to actually build your prototype. So pick a prototyping solution that provides an interaction or response that you're trying to test. And don't obsess, don't obsess over making it look perfect. Just let the participant know that it's just a prototype and that not everything's gonna work as, as if it were real. During the test, track the task to measure the usability of your solution. If enough people successfully complete a task that you identified, then you know that the solution for completing that task works. You should aim to test with at least five participants so that you collect enough data to notice any patterns in their behavior. If the majority of your users are able to complete each task, then the prototype is considered validated. And then finally, after the test, Confirm the results with your team so that everyone agrees on what they saw. Take down any changes that need to be made and test again if they're significant. If there aren't any changes that are needed, break the solution down into stories and add them to your backlog. So what outcomes did we achieve by the with the following process? Did we meet the goals that we originally set out? Well, we believe we did because we provided consumers a way to discover APIs using our search page here on the left. Here, users can quickly find the gateway instance that their API is on. Once they find it, they can click on the tile and see all of the documentation available for, that, for those endpoints within that group. And that's, you can see that on the right here. It's a documentation page that shows all the security details, the different parameters that are available, and it even allows them to test out that API. We also gave consumers a way to create and manage their own API keys, as illustrated by the screenshot on the left. Here they can copy, edit, and delete 
any of the keys that they've created. For API managers, our goal was to provide a way for them to manage access to their services. This meant giving them the ability to see who's using their APIs and revoking access if they sus suspect misuse. The screen on the right is a look at what they see. As you can see, it's a table, and it's a little different than what the API consumer sees. This is because their use case was different. We decided to use a table because it allows for better sort and filtering capabilities and the ability to quickly scan users. Now that I've given you an overview of our research process, let me tell you why I think it's valuable. Because for users, it gives them something that they're actually going to want to use. They're users, and they deserve to be delighted too. Second, it gives them the opportunity to share their perspective, making them feel more invested in your product. And lastly, it provides users a look at new features that are being developed, which could incentivize them to participate in a research session. For the teams developing the products, it builds empathy and understanding towards their users. It also provides a structured way of collecting feedback that's consistent and highly transparent. And finally, it validates that the products that they're building are actually going to deliver real value to real customers, which gives you that warm feeling inside. As for the business, well, user research provides key insights that will help you improve your business's overall developer experience. Improving your DX will lead to happier developers that will not only ad adopt your products, but actively promote them. As one DX writer writes, happy developers are chatty developers. And when we recommend products to each other, the ones with the best DX are at the top of the list. Here are some of my tips for getting started. First, choose a problem space that's relatively small or discrete. This will provide you the flexibility and freedom to experiment without feeling the pressure of getting it right the first time. Second, make a habit of it. Anytime there's an opportunity to do research, you should take it. It only gets easier with time and practice. And finally, I realize that no matter how approachable I try to make this process, it still comes down to finding the time. If this is the case for your team, well then ask if your team could benefit from having a dedicated researcher. It's worked for our team and could possibly help you too. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I'd like to let you know that we're always looking for users to talk to. And if you're interested in giving your feedback on Spring Cloud Gateway or API Hub, please reach out. Feel free to stick around for the Q&A after this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this process or about our products. Thank you all for joining, and have a wonderful night. Thanks so much um, for that, Eric. I mean, who doesn't love happy developers? Uh, and one thing that I'm noticing a theme for spring one this year and actually previous years is that you know, being in service of the developers is good for your business. So take care of those folks who are actually building out your digital business models and stuff. So anyway, stick around. We got one more session and it's going to be pretty epic. I'm pretty, I'm excited about it. <laughs>